This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. We're back. I'm Jay Fidel. This is ThinkTech, and this is our special, fancy, favorite show, the show of the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum. Every Wednesday at 4 o'clock, write that down. Uh, <laughs> today we are honored to have DLNR in force. Well, two from DLNR and one from... Department of Health. Department Office of Health. Of Environmental Quality. They work together, yeah. Yes. Suzanne Case, the Director of Land and Natural Resources. Thank you for being here, Suzanne. Thank you for having us. And uh, Scott Glenn, next to, next to her is from the, mm, mm. It's a mouthful. Go ahead. Office of Environmental Quality Control. Of course. I was about to say that very same thing. <laughs> and Sam Lemo. I am from the Office of Conservation and Coastal Lands. And you guys have one great big huge thing in common. You handle the land. How do you sleep yep. at How do you sleep at night? Well, it's, it's a big job, um, <laughs> but we're obviously very committed to it, and uh, happy to be able to work with lots and lots of people who are very committed to protecting our environment. Yeah, it's great because we only have one. That's right. Just one. That's right, and we're deeply dependent on it. And if we muck it up, it's it can't get and it we back all again. Suffer. Yeah. 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 And you were uh, you were a speaker at the um, at legislative briefing of the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum legislative briefing, all about sustainability and resilience. It's very interesting, and hopefully that'll be a focus for the legislature this season. But what we're here to talk about today is COP 23. I think COP 21, you know, sits in everybody's mind because that was the first big one. Everybody's very excited about that. A lot of press on it. Here we are, two years later, COP23. And I, I take it, all you guys went? We all yes. went. Ah, yes. Got to hear everything. This was in Paris, of course. It was in Bonn, Germany. In Bonn, Germany. It's a follow-up to the uh, conference that was in Paris okay, previously. Right. So right. That, that is generally referred to as the Paris Climate Accord okay. um, because that's, that's the climate accord that uh, you know, all the nations joined. And so this is a follow-up to that. The meeting itself was in Bonn, Germany. And uh, the purpose is you know, basically for the official negotiators to um, work out the details and implementing the agreement. But more broadly, it's turned into a, a very um, high-level um, conference, global conference uh, for all kinds of uh, uh, government and private uh, people who are trying to work out this puzzle globally. How do we, how do we protect ourselves from the impact of the climate change that we have uh, created. This is your first trip to a, a COP conference. Yes, and we were very privileged to be uh, to be asked by Governor Ige to be the state's delegation to this conference. So we all three went. We went for a week, and we we went as part of Hawaii joined um, the uh, U.S. Climate Alliance, which Governor Ige uh, signed Hawaii onto in June in New York. Um, and uh, the purpose of that really is, I mean, when you think about it, um, the, the federal government has kind of abrogated its uh, leadership role on the, on the global scene on really the Cl Paris Climate Accord. And, uh, but, you know, it's, it's not just the job of the federal government to, uh, to implement the, the terms true. of the Paris Climate Accord. And this Accord. has made that clear. And this is actually, actually I think it's been a, you know, a big kick forward because you know yeah. we've all realized on the state level and the local level that hey we we have to do it and so um, this was an opportunity for us to work together with other states um, to on this on the same challenges how do we how exactly do we do this and an opportunity really to tell the world that you know we are still in it's and a great message. we are we as these are state governments and um, and we are joined together and it is a very strong message because, you know, really that's, we, the majority of the work has to be done yeah. in our own homes. My, my reaction when I, when I heard that you went is, you and the other states went, is that, you know, where somebody critical of the U.S. might have said, oh, they turned their back on the environment. We can't really say that because 
despite the Trump administration. The fact is, a lot of people in this country, if not a majority of people, if not more than a majority of people in this country, do care about the environment. So it was a statement that Very you much. made, not only on behalf of Hawaii, but yeah. the whole country. Sure. And, and that was the message we deliberately went to make, because yeah. the U.S. Climate Alliance is now 16 states. It was 15 when we went. And I think seven or eight states went to the COP with that message. And the U.S. Climate Alliance represents 40% of the population and about $17 trillion in GDP. So we're a sizable chunk of the country saying, yes, we're Democrats, we're Republicans, we're all across the map saying, we are still in, we want to work on this, and we're here to work with you, other countries, other people, businesses, and nonprofits on climate change. I just wonder what happened in Washington when Washington found out that you were going. I mean, you, the 11 states that went, were going. Did they respond in any way? Did they say, no, you shouldn't go, or we don't care that you go, or anything? No. Well, we saw, uh, you know, evidence of them around. There, there was a, there, there were some people there actually working on the details, uh, moving uh, from, the federal, the, government. from yes. the federal government. So they were there. They also, there was also a, a, a press event stage to basically promote uh, coal. And so I don't think that went over very well. <laughs> Imagine not. No. <laughs> so they go to Bonn, probably in a big convention center, such as our Hawaii Convention Center. Mm -hmm. um, and how many people? There were total? like 20,000 20, 20, 20, people. 20,000, that's huge. Yeah. That's huge. Yeah. From yeah. all over the world, all languages, yes. all countries. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess you could get an idea about what, the may I say, the world is thinking about this issue from the people you saw there, the yeah. crowd. Yeah. And it, it's, it was a great format because each of us spoke on a panel to talk about, you know, our work that we're doing in Hawaii towards um, climate change mitigation and adaptation. And, um, and then we were also able to participate in, in, in uh, listening to the other states, what, what they're doing. So we made a lot of connections. Uh, you know, we just stood up the uh, Climate Commission that, um, that, uh, uh, that was created by the legislature mm -hmm. um, and signed into law by Governor Ige, uh, actually right when um, Trump announced that he wasn't going to, you know, stick with the Paris Climate Accord, mm -hmm. and so it gave a lot of momentum to um, to moving that forward. And there are other states who have similar climate commissions, and so we're able to, you know, now we have relationships that we can trade stories on, you know, how best to to manage this this process moving forward. So there you were, Sam giving a speech in front of delegates, maybe 20,000 of them from all around the world on climate, coming from Hawaii, which is, you know, legendary for climate, really. Um, what did you tell them? Well, first of all, it was terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> Being, you know, in Europe, in Germany, and, um, you know, um, having to speak publicly, you know, with everybody sort of glaring at you you know, in a packed room of like, you know, you know, climate scientists, climate right. polyists. People who spend their whole lives. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's like, what could I possibly have to add to the discussion? Yeah. But of course, we, that's why I was there, and uh, I just wanted to, I wanted to um, let them know that Hawaii was in, as uh, Chair Case pointed out, and that we. Uh, had passed legislation, uh, I think the only state in the country that passed legislation that specifically references the Paris Agreement as um, an element of our law. That's great. We want to implement the provisions of the Paris Agreement. Yeah. It's very clearly stated in Act um, 80, Act 32, Hawaiian Session Laws 2017. So mm -hmm. I basically was there to um, share with them, uh, not only are we in the game that wanted to um, give them a, an overview of what Hawaii's doing in order to back up its, you know, back up what, it's, what it says. And so I kind of described to them some of the initiatives that Hawaii's involved with, you know, such as our renewable energy initiatives, um, the governor's 3030 plan, sustainability initiative. Um, we want to uh, increase our sustainability by becoming uh, um, food secure. Um, we want to increase our portfolio of renewable energy through wind, geothermal, <clears throat> solar, and basically just straight conservation so they can reduce our reliance on fossil fuels. That not only reduces our carbon footprint and, and provides an example of leadership in doing so, 
it actually increases our security by reducing our reliance on imported oil. And so um, I also wanted to highlight to them um, some of our other initiatives. But um, so that's why I was there to really explain to people what we're doing. And I was very proud to announce that Hawaii really uh, is a leader in establishing this Hawaii um, Climate Change Mitigation and Adaptation Commission, of which Chair Case is, yeah. the, the, yeah. is, is the lead. Yeah. And my office is, is um, involved with um, organizing some of the logistics of the commission. And so, um, you know, the first thing that the commission did, for instance, which is huge in terms of adaptation, is they adopted or accepted the Hawaii Sea Level Rise Adaptation and Vulnerability Report, which is a comprehensive report that um, illustrates through geographic information system tools the extent of sea level rise uh, on our coastal areas throughout the state. We're going to have a, we're going to have flooding. We're going to have erosion. We're going to have damage to our infrastructure. We're going to have um, impacts to our coastal communities. You know, people. You don't sound that about this. <laughs> you know, so um, we have now um, taken the step of of towards implementing adaptation, the other side of mitigation, and so uh, uh, it's very exciting. To be involved in this and to be at this uh, at this juncture in this whole thing, and just, I think this is a really uh, highly energetic sort of um, environment we're all you know living in right now. Let's not get scared. Let's get busy doing something about mm -hmm. it. Yeah. So did you get a, ra a rousing hand of applause from all these people? Did yes. they? What did they think of your yes. comments? Well, what did they think of Hawaii? They, they asked me a couple questions about Hawaii, like, you know, can I do some research there, or do you need sure. an assistant? They come around, yeah. But, yeah, I did get a few laughs. I don't know if that was because of the way I look or I actually said something witty, but um, it, was, it, was a very, it was a very nice experience for me and very happy to have been able to have uh, gone there, with, especially with these folks. Yeah. It, was really, uh, it was really great. Did you make any friends? Um, I met a lot of people from I met a lot of people from other states uh, through the uh, that are part of the U.S. Climate Alliance, and I actually reached out to a fellow from Maryland, uh, Ben Grumbles, who is the head of their climate commission, and he sent me information about what kind of things their climate commission is focusing on to help us sort of like develop an agenda for what Hawaii wants to focus on for the next few years. So, you know, we made a lot of connections, and um, I hope to continue to maintain those. And yeah. we're in regular weekly discussions with uh, the That's Climate great. Alliance. They're staffing up. It's a real movement. And yeah. as Scott mentioned, you know, this alliance is like 40% uh, represents 40% of the population in the United States. We're like the ninth or 10th biggest economy in the world. So, you know, um, Despite what's happening at the federal level, um, these issues tend to occur at the local level, right? The mitigation efforts occur at the local level. The adaptation sure. measures occur, occur at the local level. The whole environment yeah. is local when you right. think about it. Sure, we'd like the support of the federal government on the big policies, right? We don't want to disassemble programs that help us to meet those goals. Um, but despite that, we're still going to continue doing what we're doing. Yeah. Well, one other thing is uh, just occurs to me. I mean. I've, I've always felt, see if you guys agree, I've always felt that Hawaii was a leader in this. And partly because we care about the land, because we need to care about the land. It's not an option. We must care about the land. It's only one of it. Right. I mean, we can't expand. We have only what we have. And so the question is, are, are we seen by this group, this, this 20,000 people at uh, GOP, I mean COP23, uh, are we seen as leaders? Are we seen as the iconic, you know, frontier? Well, I certainly think Hawaii has, has made major gains. I mean, the fact that we have a very aggressive renewable energy um, goal going, going back uh, some years now and that we're making significant progress on it. It's, you know, I think, I think Hawaii is ex inspiring in, on several levels. And one is aggressive goals. One is, you know, the extent that we have... Um, uh, natural resources that we can tap for energy mm. and so we're able to do a lot of uh, you know a lot of uh, experimentation we're famous for that. and and you know I always I always you know when people say you know what can I do I say do anything you possibly can 
and I call it participate in the mess because we gotta we gotta learn as we go along, and so just just do stuff, yeah. um, you know. And so trying out different different types of renewable energy is part of that, and so that's I think that's something that that you know other other places are. Everyone's interested in what everyone else is doing because you know people have different um, governments, states, uh, communities have different uh, steps they can take that move the bar forward. And so you kind of look at them and you go, "Oh, that's cool." What's that's your, what was your favorite country or state here? I mean, the one that really excited you um, is you Hawaii. Went, went Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I guess yeah. I, I deserve that. <laughs> no, a state outside or a country outside. What impressed you most? Which one? Uh, Which one? Well, they all did. I think what was interesting for me personally was uh, I attended one, I attended a couple of sessions on um, on uh, 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 one on uh, shipping and aviation because I think that's uh, I, our our frontier. So we're 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 in we're in we're very far along in renewable energy. However, I for think electricity. for for electricity. Although I think we have to in order to really make a dent in the global scene. We have to, uh, global carbon um, uh, uh, emissions, we have to do it faster. But then there's a whole second sector which uh, we're really just starting out in, and that's transportation. And so we really need to get to really renewable energy supplied transportation, electric vehicles and the like. And actually many of the other states were kind of at the same mm. stage of grappling with mm. that problem. And then we also have these other sectors that are a little bit beyond our direct control, which is shipping and aviation, but they both have a lot to do with our survival here and our global, carbon emissions. Our <laughs> carbon emissions, because yeah. those are those are you know heavily dependent on fossil fuels, yeah. and so just just to see how everyone's sort of grappling with that, and to start to think about what we can do to reduce our emissions in, in those levels as well. Okay, we're going to take a short break. When we come back, Scotty. Um, we'd like to uh, hear from you about what you said and what they said to you, your experience from your special vantage from the Department of Health. It's a little different, maybe. We'll see. We'll see right after we come back from this break. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Living in this crazy world, so caught up in the confusion, nothing is making sense for me. Hello, I'm Helen Dora Hyden, the host of Voice of the Veteran, seen here live every Thursday afternoon at 1 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. As a fellow veteran and veterans advocate with over 23 years experience serving veterans, active duty, and family members, I hope to educate everyone on benefits and accessibility services by inviting professionals in the field to appear on the show. In addition, I hope to plan on inviting guest veterans to talk about their concerns and possibly offer solutions. As we navigate and work together through issues, we can all benefit. Please join me every Thursday at 1 p.m. for the Voice of the Veteran. Aloha. Okay, we're back. We're live. I told you to come back, and we came back. See? Okay. Suzanne Case, Scott Glenn, Sam Lemo uh, from the Department of Land and Natural Resources and the Department of Health. Yeah. Talking about COP23 took place in Bonn in November, and they all went, and we want to hear a complete report. So, Scott, um, we haven't heard from you about your experience, your speech, your remarks. Were you also terrified like Sam? I was quite excited to go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so the Office of Environmental Quality Control is mainly known for environmental impact statements, environmental assessments, that, that review process. And its role is to help balance the considerations of the environment with economic development to help us make better informed decisions about who we want to be as a people. So my role with this was to support Governor with the U.S. Climate Alliance and looking at the climate change aspects in terms of our environment and economic development. And when we went to COP23, um, I was asked to speak about uh, some of the things that we're doing here in Hawaii, some of the things that we're doing with the other U.S. states. And one of the things that we focused in on was Hawaii's unique. We're one of the 50 U.S. states, but we're off on our own, and we're a Pacific island, but we're not a nation like Palau or Samoa might mm -hmm. be. So we have 
a different set of geography compared to the other U.S. states, and we have a different set of policy tools compared to our peer islands in the Pacific. And so that's created some interesting dialogue where we work with others about international climate change problems, but technically we're not a nation, a country that can sit at the table um, for like the Paris Agreement. And then similarly, when we're looking at things that we can do um, to promote conservation, we can't do things like what Palau might do where they say, okay, that's it, we're protecting all sharks, period. Uh -huh. So we don't have those same tools that they do. And so going there and listening to the other states and countries about the way they're tackling things was for us a bit of a, how do we tie this together? This is something they're doing in Maryland, but what does it mean for a Pacific Island? Or, okay, here's what some of our fellow Pacific Islanders are doing. But how do we adjust that to an American legal framework? And so that was yeah. probably the most exciting and interesting thing for me to hear. So what's your sense of it after this COP23 conference? Is, is the world, as you saw it there with those 20,000 delegates, um, is the world actually doing things now? Or is this a continuation of a kind of policy discussion uh, still waiting for implementation? It's both. And um, one of the things that we heard that we were, when we were there was that no one's doing enough. We've all put in these things called nationally determined contributions, NDCs, in the COP23 talk. and That's not money contribution. That's contribution in terms of effort. Right. Yeah. It's, it's what are we going to do to reduce our carbon emissions with the idea that we're trying to stay under 1.5 degrees rise in temperature globally, ideally, and at worst, 2 degrees. And we've already, it's already risen 1 degree. Yep. Just over 1 degree. Centigrade. Just over. Centigrade. Yeah, centigrade. centigrade. So what we does only that mean it's been successful then? It means we only have a cushion of about half a, de half a degree oh, left. Before we get to the one and a half. Yes, yeah. and then maybe one degree left. There was something arising. in the paper recently, I don't know if this was discussed at, at COP23, about how um, uh, temperatures in the world have gone up this year uh, as much as they did, or on, almost as much as they did in, I think it was 20... 16 or in 2017 so yeah there was a um to the noaa noaa just came out with yeah. a preliminary date on on 2017 it was one agency rated it as the second hottest year on record another agency rated it as the third hottest year on record but despite that that's that's some somewhat astonishing because we're in a uh, somewhat of a la nina right sort of phase where it shouldn't be as hot as that right so usually ex expect it to be cooler than yeah. it was, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, what, what sense do you have of, of the, the future of COP23, of going on COP24 mm -hmm. and all that, from your experience there? Um, did you make friends? Did you get a feeling for how the world, how, what a question, huh? did you get a feeling for how the world is conducting itself? Uh, yes, yes and no. Um, so yes, we have a sense, we did make friends and we did get a sense of what's going on. Um, the no is that everyone's still kind of scratching their heads about how do we really ramp down carbon emissions. And so we've all kind of gone back to our own countries and states to think about this. And that's what we're trying to figure out now is how do we accelerate this transition to decarbonizing our economy, to reducing carbon emissions, getting onto renewable energy, figuring out the international part. And that's probably what's going to continue at these future COPs is how do we keep the international trade situation, um, something stable, but yeah. also decarbonizing it. <clears throat> yeah. Um, I was also going to ask you, uh, you know, what, what we can do, what you brought back from this conference that would be useful. I will ask you also, Suzanne. Um, did you, was there any idea um, that came back, either from the states you were with or from, you know, the conference in mm -hmm. general uh, that was prominent? Probably for, for me, the most interesting idea was the idea of a carbon budget, was to look at the total amount of carbon that one can emit and still stay below 1.5 degrees or 2 degrees versus how much carbon you plan to emit, and then looking at the gap between the two and then what you can do to reduce that gap. Are countries doing this? Uh, Are states doing this? They're starting to. We're starting to. So the United Nations releases a report every year saying here's the gap between what people have promised to do 
and here's what everybody really needs to do. Here's the promise, here's where we need to be. And so states and countries are now starting to figure out how do we close that gap. Yeah. But you know, one one last uh, thing, Scott, and that is, you know, did you did you ever get feeling that you know this is a point I raised at the briefing a few weeks ago, that Hawaii is a little speck on the map, even if we were the best good guys in the world, what effect would we have, you know, on carbon emissions in this little tiny set of islands? It it's the same effect we have in other conversations, which is if Hawaii can do it, we can do it. As a leader of someone, it's a small place small carbon emissions, if we can figure it out, that means other people can now say, Hawaii did it. It's leadership. Yes, it's exactly uh, that. I, 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 I think that's great. So talk about uh, you know, the, the carbon tax or the carbon ledger, if you will. Sure, the carbon budget is, is a, I think it's a very powerful concept because it, 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 it tells us uh, if we're gonna really play fair on the global scene and globally we need to uh, eliminate this much carbon this fast, then what do we need to do here? So we come back with a sense of urgency and a, uh, and a sense of analytics, like here's, our, here's what we can do in renewable energy for electricity, here's where we need to get to in uh, transportation, uh, here's some things we could do in shipping, slow down, uh, have more efficient um, uh, fuels, use biofuels, but even just slowing down it makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. Um, and then same for aviation. So we have sort of a map to follow and uh, with the carbon budget uh, concept, we can, we can try to uh, see you know, where are our goals now and then what do we need to accelerate to get there. So I, you know, I think you, you come back with obviously that sense of urgency, but also that sh sense of, of shared purpose. And no matter, no matter how small we are, we're all in this together. It's one world and so everybody needs to do their part. Amen to that. So at, at the legislative briefing, we covered some of this. Um, and uh, here you are, I shouldn't say fresh back, but recently back from COP23. Um, what's the mood in this session? I mean, they're talking about affordable housing. They're talking about coping with the, um, you know, the changes in the, in the tax reform bill in Washington um, and the so social safety net, lots of priorities. Sure. Um, are you asking them for uh, a carbon budget here? So I, I would say there's lots of interest uh, still in the legislature for moving the whole uh, carbon, um, carbon initiative forward. And so one of the things we can look at here, which is something that DLNR has been working pretty hard on, is how can we offset carbon emissions um, in other ways that are beneficial to the environment? And primarily for us, the opportunity is to plant trees. If we can plant trees in our native forest, just growing a tree, you know, the old, you know, breathe in car oxygen and exhale that's what you know what so the trees do, do versus do so do so we send the high school kids so, out there with so we're, trees. We're, we're doing uh two things one is we are we are we are working on actual projects on the ground uh one on maui one on the big island to 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 have large-scale uh tree planting and but we're also working with california with these relationships that we've developed to try to get california certified first on the voluntary carbon market and then on the compulsory carbon market. If we can do that, then the price of carbon is, uh, is significantly better and that way we can um, sell credits uh, and, and use that money to plant the trees. So there's, there's uh, some pretty exciting things uh, we can so do. So that would fund the tree planting. That yes. would fund oh, the I tree see. planting. Effectively, yeah. polluters in other parts of the world yeah, sure. would pay us to plant trees. It's like the barrel tax. You take it from one side and put it on the other side right. and you change conduct that yes, way. Yes, exactly. So um, what legislation do we need? What, what legislation is in the pipeline, if anything? So there's, there's uh, I guess there's a lot of uh, initiatives uh, moving forward. Uh, the, the sea level rise report just came out, so that's we're all kind of digesting that, and you know that will guide policy sort of in the long, in the long run. And obviously, uh, 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 you know we're just finishing the the deadline for introduction of bills. So there's a lot of bills uh, that uh, people have proposed, so we're reviewing them now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I guess the other uh, part of our next step forward is moving the climate commission forward. So we've we've met twice now with this very. Um, a broadly constitu constituted uh, group. Um, public meetings, we can public, come and watch. Public meetings, yeah. yeah. The next one will be, the third one will be uh, probably at the end of February. And, you know, we'll be looking at 
what kind of goals should we be setting? You know, can we use the carbon budget concept to, to help guide our goals and our implementation? And at the same time, what are the kinds of things we can do to, um, to not just mitigate in terms of uh, lowering our climate emissions, but also to adapt, such as you know, uh, uh, adjusting to sea level rise and and uh, manage retreat from the coastal. Well, there's areas. another area of discretion within uh, DLNR anyway, and that is uh, you know you have permitting, and you have all kinds of administrative decisions, you know, and processes. Does what you learned at uh, COP21 affect your view of that? Does it affect policy? And implementing existing regulations? Does it call for new ones? Does it call for a different approach, for example, in dealing with applications for various permits and you know approvals and the like? Is that filtering through the LNR right now? Um, so I would say the 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 part that's uh, permitting is is more on the um, on the adaptation side. You know, people are struggling obviously with with um, with wave inundation in coastal areas. So. Um, it gives us an opportunity to to see what other other states are doing that are coastal states that are that are going to be um, similarly challenged. You know, ha, the big question for us in Hawaii is how do we protect our beaches at, at a time when um, uh, houses and highways along the coastal areas are are getting um, yes, you know hit, hit by waves. Now. It's a it's a tough decision, and um, and so that's it's it's a case by case thing. But we at least understand what our what our priorities are and what our challenges are, and try to you know brainstorm different paths to move forward so that we preserve our most important uh, assets, which are our, our beaches and our coastal areas. Yeah, yeah our very in this challenging really. time. Yeah. So what about the public? Is the public on board about this? When you deal with uh, you know the people who come before the agency, are they sensitive to this issue? When they file papers with you, make arguments with you, have hearings with you, are they responding to you know what they should be, you know, considering, in the way of uh, uh, concern about climate change? I've I have found that because I deal with a lot of people on a day-to-day -day basis in my regulatory role, and um, I've I've actually been quite surprised at uh, sort of the extent to which people seem to be on the bus with respect to the gravity of this issue and, and then maybe wanting to help us, you know, steer the bus somewhere, some way to find, you know, reasonable, rational solutions to, to get ourselves out of this mess. Um, really, there's been a lot of people that have been genuinely, genuinely sort of interested in what we're doing and um, would like to help. And um, I'm not sensing a lot of sort of um, deniers mm. that are around us in this state, yeah. which is very pleasant that experience. Is nice to know. Yeah. I almost <laughs> wish for them sometimes just so we can have like, you know, a discussion <laughs> about issues, you know, to keep the fire burning. But they're not really out there for some reason in this wonderfully liberal state of Hawaii. <laughs> that was something we learned at, the, at COP23 from the other U.S. states is that we're very fortunate that almost all of our elected leadership is on board with climate action, yeah. both mitigation and adaptation. Yeah. There's a broad consensus in Hawaii about, how, about just the direction to move. We're not even fighting over whether climate change is real or not, unlike the other states. There are some people out there, though, Scott, you know, in, in Hawaii, even mm -hmm. though we all agree it's an, an environmentally centric kind of society we have. Um, who, who don't who don't know that they need to care, so I'd like you to talk to Camera One out there, and tell them why they need to care, really really care about this issue, about COP21, and about the state of Hawaii's participation in COP21. There's Camera One. So the challenge is to me. Yeah. Why <laughs> not? Well, for all of you listening, um, thank you for listening, and you live here in Hawaii. And as we all know, our tourism, our economy is, is premised on our environment and the quality of our environment and caring for it. We all have a deep connection to it, including our host culture. Hawaiians have taught us how to care for this place. And so we need to spend more attention to it. And so when we come together 
and look at our environment and how are we going to continue living here in a meaningful way and have a good well-being, then we need to look out to the future and how things are changing because our best science tells us that we know that the conditions that we built our current civilization on are changing. Fundamental conditions in temperature, wave, ocean action, rainfall, wind patterns are all shifting. And so these are things we need to look to in order for us to continue to call Hawaii home and for it to be a place for our children to live at. Yeah. You got to look past the sidewalk in front of your house to see the whole enchilada. So I have one last thing for you, Suzanne, and that is what's going to happen here? What's going to happen in terms of COP21, uh, COP23 going to COP24? What's going to happen to those 2,000 people? They get 20,000, excuse me, 20,000 people. It's going to be 30,000. What's going to happen to those 11 states? How much, how many more states will get on board? And what's going to happen, you know, for DLNR in the future? Uh, are you going to stay bonded up, hopefully, with uh, COP24 and 5 and 6? So we'll certainly, we'll certainly track how, how it's moving along. And um, again, it, this is a participation on the international and national and local le level, state and local governments. Um, I sense, uh, as with Scott and Sam, um, a, a, a kind of collective sense of now's the time. You know, we've been we've been talking about this for a while, but now we're really seeing the impacts in terms of uh, global climate change, in terms of our coastal areas, our storms, uh, drought, and the like. And um, and and so and, and I don't I don't think there's really any deniers um, um, to speak of here, not not of not, any, here. not of any scale. And so you know, it's the opportunity for us all to work together to just work at solutions and you know some of them are big ideas and some of them are just chipping away at it you know day after day um, on every little opportunity and that's what you know I think we're all working on together and I, I appreciate that everyone uh, in Hawaii is is joining in this. Thank you Suzanne. Suzanne Case, Scott Glenn, Sam Lemo, great to have you guys here. Let me only say that if this isn't clear to everybody right now wait till the storms this coming summer then it'll be really clear. You'll come back then, right? Happy to. Happy Absolutely. to. Thank you yes. so much. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Aloha. <laughs>